that. No, 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 no. Lego Island is a themed action adventure game developed and published by Mindscape in 1997 for PC, PlayStation, Sega Saturn, N64, and Game Boy. Mindscape, a developer known for other adventure games such as Shadowgate and Moonstone A Hard Day's Night, would see a lot of success and praise for this title. Two more Lego Island games would come out in the future, however, Mindscape would not see any part of them as one day prior to release of Lego Island, Mindscape fired the entire development team, possibly to avoid having to pay them royalties. Some would call that a dick move. Before I get into the game itself, let me talk a bit about what I had to do to actually get it running. After downloading the ISO, because who has a disk drive anymore, I went to PCGamingWiki.com. This is the same site I used to get Condemned Criminal Origins to run correctly. It was here that I found a download for DG Voodoo, a piece of software that allows the user to set custom parameters to emulate older games. But I wasn't done yet. From this point, I relied on YouTube to show me the proper setup and found a video from 2018 by user Xanthera that gave me the rest of the files and tweaks that I needed. Since the game was made back for Windows 95, it was only meant to run at around 10 frames a second. Luckily, DG Voodoo allowed me to limit my frames to a custom number. Movement was still twitchy, but at least all the animations played correctly. I don't remember the frame rate looking this ass before. Of course, a link to all of these should be in the description down below if I remember, but use them at your own risk, and of course, with everything, your mileage may vary. Now, back to the game. Lego Island is a non-linear game with somewhat limited open world concept, and right from the start we can tell what tone this game is going to be. After the intro cinematic, we are greeted by the Infomaniac, the main character that acts as an in-game tutorial while you play. His actions are erratic and all over the place, exactly what a kid with ADD in the 90s needed. In Lego Island, you play as one of five characters, each with their own personal backstory. We can choose from Nick Brick, a serious guy noir style detective with an incredible memory and insatiable hunger for donuts, or maybe play as Nick's sister Laura, who would be the good cop in all scenarios. Also available are Mama and Papa Briccolini, the stereotypical Italian owners of the only eating establishment in town. Or finally, we can choose Pepperoni, the adopted son of the Briccolinis, who, as he says, I'm the pizza delivery dude, the dude with the food. Check it out. Perfect angle. 45 degrees. Personally, I like the way the developer fleshed out the characters and made cinematics to go along with them even though the diversity among the characters is somewhat weak. As a kid, though, that never really bothered me. Other than each character's backstory, there's not much of a main storyline. There is an endgame, but I'm not ready to talk about that yet. Instead, I want to talk about all the pre-game story that was given to us. That's right, it's lore video time. As most of you know, I'm a sucker for lore and backstories, and surprisingly, this game has a whole story detailing how the island came to be. It's given to the player in the form of a comic book that doubles as the user's manual. <laughs> what is this art style? This kid's neck is like a foot long. In the comic book, we follow the Infomaniac, the creator of Lego Island, as well as most of its inhabitants, as he begins life, along with his first toy, a red brick. The Infomaniac begins life by building a boat that he uses to explore the neighboring waters, all while building the rest of the world around him. As time passes, the Infomaniac gets lonely, so he creates his first friend, the Brickster, who he literally built already wearing a prison uniform and looking like a career criminal. You can see where this is going to go. Eventually, the Infomaniac wants to make more friends for the group to play along with, and the Brickster doesn't like that idea. He goes crazy with jealousy. The Brickster turns maniacal and runs away with some of the bricks from the island to go build his own island he calls Ogle Island. Which, after a lot of googling, I found out is Lego spelled backwards. Some would call me a detective. As for the endgame, well, I don't want to ruin it for anyone who really wants to play this game, but who can't afford the hardware needed to run it, so if that person is you, skip to this time in the video. Gone? Good. Since the Brickster has been locked up for always trying to steal bricks or ruining Lego Island, you would think he's no longer a threat and that the police would have him under the strictest of security. Well, unfortunately, you're wrong. No, 
All it takes to get him loose is a simple plan and a willing participant who can't read. And we just happen to have one of those. As long as you are playing as Pepper and you've built the police helicopter, you have access to a different version of the pizza delivery mission. Instead of the normal delivery, Papa Briccolini gets a call that sounds like Nick from the jail. The order is for a jalapeno red pepper anchovy double garlic pizza, the strongest pizza on the entire island. Something seems a little off, but oh well, what could go wrong, right? It's Lego. Upon arriving at the jail, however, Nick is nowhere to be found, and the brickster convinces us to give him the pizza instead. Obviously a big mistake. Using the pizza fumes, the brickster melts the lock of his jail cell and steals the helicopter. Before flying away, he flies to the top of the information center and steals the red power brick, an item that the brickster needs to enact his terrible plan of deconstructing the entire island. Of course, the police respond immediately to the jail, and a cutscene ensues that tells us this has happened before and what we need to do. The brickster has run off to the other side of the island, and it's up to us to try to stop him. Nick and Laura meet you there on their motorcycles once you arrive, and we see our villain's plan in action with yet another stolen vehicle. This time, it's the ambulance. The Brickster drives off, but not before shrinking a palm tree to show us the devastation and the fate of the island. Seeing an opportunity, Nick and Laura race towards him, but he escapes by dropping a piece of the stolen helicopter to block our pursuit. A new plan is devised, and we're tasked with following the Brickster and collecting anything he drops. He begins to shrink some of the residential buildings on the island and runs away whenever we get close, once again blocking our path with stolen pieces of the helicopter. Eventually, the Brickster gets tired of the cat and mouse, so he scatters the remaining four pieces around the island for us to find. Once all the pieces have been gathered, it is time to enact the plan that will bring the Brickster to justice. After rebuilding the helicopter and with the help from the police and the pizzeria, we are fully equipped for the final task. We have to fly around the island in the helicopter and assist the police using a donut launcher. Nick and Laura will be patrolling on their motorcycles at an alarmingly slow pace. However, if they spot a donut, they'll move towards it and get a little bit of a speed boost, essentially allowing us to lead them where they need to go. At the same time, we can slow down the Brickster as he shrinks down the remaining buildings on the island by using the other weapon equipped on the helicopter, a pizza launcher. Depending on how well you do will determine the outcome of the island. If the Brickster is caught, we see his arrest, and a massive celebration along with a parade dedicated to Pepper's valiant efforts is shown. It's all very fun and a satisfying reward for all the buildup that led to that moment. However, if you fail like I did multiple times, we see a slow zoom out of the Brickster and the devastation around the island with a lot of crying and sadness. Of course, if this latter scenario plays out, the game's not over, so you're free to start the whole mission over and try again. You know, just like in real life. If you got this far, you will know that there is not much to say about the graphics. I'm sure the developers did what they could with the technology that they had at the time, and honestly, the target audience for this game wouldn't care about the quality. Focusing on things like ground textures and shading is going to leave any reviewer sorely disappointed, and the developers knew that. You see, they knew their target audience and focused on what really mattered in the game, the LEGO models. And that's where this game does it right. The time spent in recreating many of the LEGO city sets in 3D is apparent. Each building and vehicle is faithfully recreated to provide a full first-person view of the exterior, as well as a few building interiors to add life to the plastic world. For the other buildings you can interact with, the development team went with a static point-and-click aesthetic that adds its own character to the scenes. Using arrows found at the edge of the screen that are incorporated into the world with LEGOs, the player can freely look around the pre-rendered scenes, each with interactable objects. I personally like the mixing of mediums, I'm a huge point-and-click fan, but also love the freedom of a 3D environment. Both aesthetics are bright and colorful and lend to the whole LEGO feeling. To further complement those feels, we are given about 20-ish colorful soundtracks composed by Lauren Nelson, who I had to look up online, but I really couldn't find anything else about. Music changes as we move around the island and songs rage from somber jazz near the police station. to aggressive wipeout surfer music at the beach. Each song fit well to the theme and the fun of the game. One song in particular really caught my attention and has been playing on repeat in my mind since childhood. It's a country rock song called Brick by Brick, 
And now I hope it's also stuck in your head so you can suffer as well. The quality overall for sound is lacking. For the most part, the music as well as all the voice acting and sound effects are highly compressed. Like they were recorded through a microphone placed next to an answering machine of that era, if you even know what an answering machine is. The voice acting though is good, uh, but the mixing could have used some work, with many times dialogue easily being overrun by music and sound effects. There's not much more to say here, so I guess I'm just going to move on to... For such a small game compared to later titles, LEGO Island has a lot of thought and promise put into it. I have no doubt in my mind that if given today's creative freedom and modern hardware, LEGO Island could have been bigger than Minecraft. Even for its time, there are so many things put into this game. It's staggering. From all of the interactions between characters to the fun everyday jobs of the denizens, it is a world that any LEGO fan will want to live in. Speaking of that, I might as well talk about what there is to actually do. After selecting the character you want to play as, you can move around the main building known as the Information Center. On one of the pre-rendered scenes is a large floating block with a column consisting of character portraits and labels representing one of the five activities you can partake in. Activities such as races will earn a score based on position. Red is first, blue is second, green third, and gray means you haven't participated yet. Besides racing, there are three missions to do. Simple jobs with humor and twists at every turn. For instance, you can help enter and return as the driver of the ambulance, navigating road hazards as you make your way to the scene of an accident. Or you can help Nubby, the mechanic, by driving the tow truck to the racetrack, also while avoiding roadblocks, to get a car off the track so the race can continue. Finally, if those don't appeal to you, you can take the job of pizza delivery and once again navigate obstacles to deliver food to hungry customers. As a kid, this was more than enough to keep me entertained for hours, and things like races actually required you to build the vehicle prior to participating. And of course, what would a LEGO game be without building? Although somewhat limited, the functions are smooth and satisfying. Each build consists of the same premise. You navigate a rotating system of blocks, choose a paint or decal, and then line it up with a flashing indicator to add it to the build. There's no custom building, however, but that's probably a limitation that's to be expected of a game of this age. After your model is built, you are free to use it in the associated race. Other vehicles can be built or found around the island, like I was saying earlier, and those can be used to explore or as a quicker way to from point A to point B. To be perfectly honest, if you haven't realized it yet, this game was developed to sell more Legos. Giving a limited experience would inspire kids to want to build their own experiences in real life. And the developers did nothing to hide that. In fact, they even included advertising right as you started the game. In the information center, next to the block showing your progress, are boxes of Legos on a shelf. If you click on them, they show off the sets they are modeled after. I mean, what did you expect from a merchandise company? Hiding subtle messages between a fun and colorful facade is an easy way to get kids to bug their parents for more. The game itself was just a quick hit to keep kids tidied over until their next birthday or major holiday. I'm not mad about this, it's actually pretty genius, and I applaud LEGO Media for doing it. I mean... After finishing the game, I went and spent my whole life savings on Legos. So instead of having to make friends, I can just build my own. In the end, with Lego Island being the first in a string of many to come, players were anxious for the next installment. We tasted what could be, and with technology still rising, what was to come could only get better. So the real question comes down is, should you play this game? My answer is, if you haven't played it, don't bother. The time and effort it took me to get it running is not worth the hour it takes to see and do nearly everything on the island. However, if you want some nostalgia, absolutely go for it. There's a dedicated community to Abandonware Online that will lead you to be able to fix any issue you have, and there will be many. If you can hear me, go to the residential area. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> technical difficulty. Well, that's it. My review of Lego Island. So tell me, did you play this game as a kid? Do you look at the same way I do? If not, let me know down below. Also, if you like what I did here and you want to see more, hit the like button. If enough interest is shown, I will continue down the list of other Lego media titles and maybe beyond. With that being said, I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, bye bye